You may be seated. Worship is a wonderful thing. Worship is an opportunity for us just to be in tune with God. Sometimes during our weeks um, and our lives get so busy that sometimes we put our worship opportunity on the back burner and sometimes we just deal with life and things happen and, and as things take place we start looking at ourselves and on our own focus and on what's going on in our own lives or our family's lives and sometimes we just need to take a, take a break. And worship is just the cleaning of the heart, focusing on God, allowing nothing else to bother us so we can say, Lord, talk to me. Lord, teach me. Lord, give to me the insight that I need to have in order for me to grow. And as a believer, and as a Christian, and as a church, there's always things that we need to glean. We have to grow. If we ever get to the point that we think, you know what, I've got this Christianity thing down. I've got this Bible thing down. I know what it says. I know how to do it. You know what? I don't really need to worry about learning. We have then just turned our eyes off of God and put our eyes firmly on ourselves because we just said, I know God. I know what God wants for me. And whenever we say we know what God wants for us, we are putting ourselves outside of God's blessing plan. Do y'all want to be blessed by God? Don't we want God to bless us? Don't we want God to work within our lives to give us some insight and to allow us the freedom, allow us to have God's blessing upon our life? But in order to do that, we can't put God in a box. We can't say, I know what he's going to do and I know what I'm going to do tomorrow or the next day. We have to stretch. We have to allow God to penetrate our eyes and our hearts. And that sometimes we have to have that, that, that sunbeam deep within us. So when we see the truth, we can apply that truth. And sometimes that truth is not easy. And we are on a series called Defining Moments. Today we're going to be talking about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler didn't have a name. They just defined him as the rich young ruler. But there is moments in time where you realize there is a truth you knew, a truth you forgot, or a truth you didn't know. And at one moment in time when God penetrates your heart and opens up the light of defining moments, you have to go back and say, you know what, I used to know that. When I was in the youth department, somebody taught me that. But as I got older, I turned my back from God, and I started doing my own thing, and I now remember what I used to know, and it's a shining light into our hearts. But you know what? If I have to go back to do that, I may have to give up this. If I'm going to do what God wants me to do, I'm going to have to say no to some other things. And sometimes those defining moments, we accept and we grow and we walk towards, but sometimes we say, nah, not today. Not for me. You may have to face some hard truths about a lot of different things. About your marriage. About your children. About who you're dating and who you're going to get married to. You have to deal with some hard truths about your finances. And in every area of our life, sometimes there's defining moments that either we stick our head in the sand and say it's going to get better, or we pull up and say, what does God want me to do? But in any area... If we do not allow God to speak to us, in other words, take the bright light of God's word and allow him to penetrate your heart, it, it may not be easy. And you may not like what he's going to show you. But it's very important that we allow God to speak to us. So let's take God's word. And let's take a story. Let's take a story that's going to be unpopular to some of you. Some of you say, well, you know what, Bruce? I don't really know if I like that story or not. Well, you know what? God understands the biggest separation between your seeking God and going after yourself. In John chapter 15, verse 7, it says, if you abide in me, in other words, if you hold on to me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. But it doesn't say you can ask anything in my name and it's going to be done for you. I just want to pray for this. And if I pray for this, God is going to give me the Santa Claus wish from heaven. And I'm going to have everything he wants because I asked for it and because I deserve it. But it does say, if you abide, if you dwell, if you allow God to work within your life, 
and my words, God's words, abide in you. In other words, if you know it's God's will, if you know you're doing what God wants you to do and you're abiding in his presence, you're plugged into the vine and God is talking to you and you're praying to him and you're worshiping his name and whatever he's asking you to do, you feel the presence of God. You can ask anything and God will provide. But sometimes the searchlight is hard. And today it's going to be one of those searchlights. It was this rich young ruler that inspired Jesus to say these famous words. Again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's all kinds of debates about what the eye of the needle is, whether it was actually an eye of a needle or it was a, it was a gate going into the city of Jerusalem that the camels had to steep down and have to unpack their bags and just, so they could crawl through in the city of nights. But the eye of the needle would be a very difficult thing for any goat, any goat, any camel to go through. It wouldn't be an easy thing. It is, it is not easy. It doesn't say it's impossible. But it's not easy for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I know this is a surprise to us living in the United States. But every one of us in here, guess what? You are rich. You are. We are. In the United States of America, we have unfathomable wealth compared to the rest of this world. So when we're looking at if, if it is very difficult for us to enter into the kingdom of God, what do we need to do? How can we explain to God, I have resources you have blessed me with. The rich man is often so blind to his spiritual condition, he always focuses on his needs and not what God wants. He is proud of his accomplishments and content with what he has. He is likely too humble. He's likely too full of himself to humble himself before God. Just as the camel has to be unloaded with all of his baggage to get into the eye of the needle, to get into the city of Jerusalem, so often we have to unload our baggage before we allow God to put the searchlight into our hearts to see what God wants for our lives. There's four mistakes that this rich young ruler said. There's four mistakes, and I think when we look at these four mistakes, they're very obvious, but yet we can apply these four mistakes. He did not recognize Jesus as Lord. This rich man, he came to Jesus, and let's look at that in verse 17. Now, as he was going out of the road, one came running, knelt before him, and said to him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What can I do? Good teacher. In other words, he's not saying you're a great teacher. He didn't recognize him as a great Lord. He just recognized him as a teacher, a good teacher, a good man. Somebody that knows the law, that no, no spiritual matters. As he was going out, but I like the way he came running to him. Jesus, perceiving the young man's intent, answering the question, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but that is God. Why are you calling me? There's nobody good except for God. There's nobody righteous except for God. Jesus knew his heart, and he knew his problem. He knew what he needed to do. He's recognized his biggest mistake right there is he did not recognize who Jesus is. And sometimes when we take the word of God and the searchlight is in our life, we have to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for you, and Jesus doesn't want you to stay where you are. He wants to put that searchlight right into your life and say, here's who I am. This is what I'm doing. There's none good except for God. And then he goes on and, and he starts explaining to this guy the second mistake. He wasn't aware of his own faults. He wasn't aware of his own faults in verses 19 and 20. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And then the guy interrupted. He said, hey, answered and said to him, teacher, not master, not Lord. He said, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Jesus looked at him. And perceived in his heart, he said to him probably the same thing that you said to him right then. 
Liar. Yeah. You're, you're, you're telling me that you're so good that, that you've never even thought a bad thought? You've never got mad at somebody that, that uh, said something bad to you? The Bible even says in the New Testament that Jesus, if you look upon a woman and have lust after you've committed adultery already, are you saying you haven't done that? Are you saying that you haven't even thought a bad thought? Jesus said, oh, dude, you're not getting it. This guy isn't good enough. You can't go to heaven because you're good. You can't do things because you're good. Suppose you thought for a minute this wealthy man had never violated a single thing, has never done anything wrong. Suppose he hadn't stolen, he had never spoken bad words. The other commandments have to do with God to man. This relationship, this young man had obviously not fulfilled the relationship between God and man. Honor thy father, honor thy mother. I can do some of those things, but when it talks about putting no other gods before me, putting no other gods before me, well, we're going to see just a few minutes what this man's God was. And it wasn't Jesus, and it wasn't the Lord. He didn't recognize his own faults. He had, sometimes there's a word become, that's called being self-aware. If we are not self-aware of our own abilities, our own faults, and our own issues, we'll never be able to deal with ourselves, and God will never be able to have an opportunity to deal with us. When we become self-aware, that means I realize my weaknesses. I realize what I need. Being self-aware is not arrogance. Being self-aware is being humble, understanding what God can and needs to do within my life. The third thing, his mistake, is he misunderstood the plan of grace. He misunderstood the plan of grace. He said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? What good thing? What's, what's the 11th commandment? What do I have to do? I know that I have a, a, a barrier between me and God. I, I'm doing all the right things, but I just don't feel, I just don't have it. What, what other good thing can I do? What other, what other commandment can I have? And Jesus looked at him and he perceived in his heart, he knew who he was, he knew his problem. And I loved what Jesus said then. Then Jesus, looking at him, see what he said? Loved him. He loved him. He knew that he didn't know the truth. He knew that he didn't know who Jesus was. He knew that he didn't have a relationship with God. He knew that he was lying. He knew that he wasn't a good man. He may have had resources, but he wanted to earn his way to heaven. Can you imagine? And he said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then after he loved him, after he looked at him, after you felt the presence of God and you felt the peace of God, this man was in the face of Almighty God in the flesh. He's lying to God and God in spite of himself, loved him, loved him. And when he loved him, this guy said, Jesus isn't mad. His heart went out to him. His heart was searching. And he said to him, one thing you lack. One thing you lack. Can you imagine what that thing is? One thing you lack. Go away, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And this guy's thinking, no, 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 you're not getting it, Lord. Give me a commandment. Give me another law. Give me something else I can do. Just tell me the 11th or the 12th or the 13th commandment. I'll do whatever you want. I just want eternal life. I need to earn my way. And he said to him, then you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up my cross and follow me. I could see what the guy was saying. He's got his notepad out. He said, okay, okay, let, 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 let's get the idea. You're, you're saying this. You're saying you want me to sell everything I have. I believe he didn't write that down. He said, 
and give it to the poor. I don't believe he wrote that down. And then he said, after I don't have anything, I've sold every possession that I have and I've given it to the poor. You want me to give up my occupation? You want me to follow you around with these guys? He said, I don't know about this rewards in heaven thing. I'm used to having it the way I want it down here. In John chapter 17, verse 3, it says this. And this is eternal life, that you may know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with God. Eternal life is not your possessions, and it's not going to church. Eternal life is that you know that Jesus Christ loves you and died on the cross. And at this time, this guy has had a, a beam right into his life, and he has to realize, I, I don't want Jesus. I don't want God. I want to use whatever they have in order for me to be better. I want at the end of my life to go to heaven, but I don't want to give God my life. I don't want to give God my resources. I don't want to give up what I have. I just want to take what he can give to me, add to what I have. And that rich young ruler is just like many of us. We love God and we want God, but we don't want to give our lives to God. We don't want to give our stuff to God. We just want to give God a little bit of room in my life so when I die, I get to go to heaven and I'll be happy. And God looked at his heart and he was, he was loving him. And sometimes when Jesus loves you, it's kind of like your parents. When you ever, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Yeah, boy, it's going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt you. When you loved him, the bright light was shown upon him. Now, if Jesus said, you know what, I, you're not going to follow me, just get out of here. Jesus would not have loved him. But when Jesus said this to him, he said, you know what, there's one thing that you lack. Your God is not my God. Your God is in your stuff. Your stuff owns you. Your stuff that you will not give up owns you. And when it owns you, you have no control over it. The guy is like, well, I just wanted another law. I just wanted to be good enough. I just wanted to do something else. So when God looks at me, I'm good enough. Give me another law. And Jesus is saying, it is not the plan. Being good, keeping the law, being who you think you are is never good enough. It wasn't good enough last week. It's not good enough this week. The only way we get to heaven is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not about the law. It's about breaking our heart so we can see who Jesus is. And Jesus said, listen, dude, I want to give you something. I want you to sell everything that you have. I want you to be broken down enough that you will follow me. I don't want your money. Give it to the poor. It's not about me. Give it to the poor. And when you give it to the poor, find out where I am and follow me. Imagine what he just said there. I want you to follow me. I want you to be one of my disciples. He just gave him an invitation to be a life changer for the rest of the life and for the rest of the world, for the church. Follow me. Be one of my disciples. And the fourth mistake he made, he went away. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. You know what he just said to God? No. No deal. Not good enough. I don't care about the treasures in heaven. I care about what I have. I care about my occupation. I care about my life. I care about my life. I don't want to sell everything. <laughs> These guys are filthy. You don't even have a house. You don't have a hotel room. You, 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 guys, you guys are kind of nasty. I just, want, I just know you know something. I, I don't want to follow you. I don't want to do the stuff that you're doing. I just want you to tell me what to do. But he was sad at his word. Could you imagine just saying no to God? No, thank you. 
In a way, I think this is his biggest mistake of his life, saying no to Jesus. You know, you can, under, you can misunderstand at this point Jesus' divinity. He's a good teacher. He didn't know that he was the son of God. He didn't know that he was going to die on the cross. He's just a good man that he could see, that he perceived that he had power from God, that he knew a lot of things about God. But, you know, staying with God changes everything. But sometimes God asks us to do the supernatural in our own lives in order to prove who God is in your life. In John chapter 15, verse 7 again, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. It depends what your desire is. It doesn't say if you abide in yourself. It doesn't mean if you believe your own words. It doesn't mean if you have your expectation, your desires, this is what I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Now I'm going to ask God to give me what I want. That's opposite. He said, if you abide in me, if you have a relationship with me and my words stay with you, it doesn't change what God will do for us. God will give us desires. It changes what our desires are. And our desires are to please him, to honor him, to take care of him. He left sad. Now, I don't know what the guy's name is. It could be George. It could be Fred. But you know what? We don't know. It could have been Matthew, Paul, Luke, Peter. It could be somebody that our kids' names, that we name our kids after because they were a follower of Christ. It could have been something very special. But the guy said, no. Could you imagine? He hears that Jesus was doing these miracles. And he hears that Jesus goes to Jerusalem. He hears that Jesus is crucified. At that time he may say, ooh, made a good decision there. And then he hears that Jesus rose from the grave. And then he hears Jesus is deity. He looks back at that moment in time and he said, what if? What if? I would have said, yes. What if, if I didn't hold on to the stuff that I have, hold on to my life, and I just said, yes. I could have been like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, which everybody, they left their fishing. They left everything that they had. They forsook it all and followed after Christ. They didn't care what they left behind. They turned and followed Christ. That day, they followed Christ. There are things within our life that are holding you back, that holds me back. What would it take to radically change our life and say, I don't care. I want Jesus, and I don't want to walk away sad when Jesus loved me. He opened up my eyes and the searchlight was in my life and I had to determine, am I going to look in the light and I'm going to allow the light of his penetrating light in my heart? If I'm going to focus on that, I'm going to follow what he says. Or will we be like the rich young ruler, lowered his head, said, nope, not worth it. Not worth the life change. Not worth the sacrifice. Not with these guys. And not with you. He walked away sad. Everything about his life came to a pinnacle at that time. And he chose poorly. He chose poorly. They were willing to commit a lifestyle of learning about him. They wanted him. Jesus knew that this man had a seeking heart. But when he said, I'm too busy collecting my possessions and my money, I have too much to manage. This is important because the subject makes us uncomfortable, and it should. Because here's the point, if you get nothing else. Nothing competes for your pursuit of God more than the management of your wealth and your possessions. Nothing. Nothing manages, nothing changes 
the pursuit that you have of God. Either the pursuit of God compels you. We get up in the morning and we want to worship. We pray, we ask, we ask God about decisions. We ask God where we're going to spend our money, what we're going to do, where am I going to work. There's nothing that, that, that makes a bigger roadblock in our pursuit of God than our power and our resources and our monies. So here's the question. What if? What if God asked you to do something? So, not, not, not verbally. Somebody gives you a need. Somebody tells you that, that, that I need you. And God, God pricks your heart. You don't hear him audibly, but you're saying, I don't get this. I don't have a lot of resources, but God is asking me to help that person out. And you say, I'll sleep on it. But at night, you start thinking about what God wants you to do. And there's times in our life where God wants to use what you have to impact the kingdom of God. And if we do not use what we have to impact the kingdom of God, God will not give you more to use. What he wants to do, he wants to be a conduit of blessing within your life. But what we cannot do is say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to walk away from you. I'm going to do what I want to do. He's going to walk away and you're going to be sad. You're going to remember what you could have done. Nothing competes more for the pursuit of God than managing our wealth. You have defining moments in your finances. God will say, I want you to do something. I want you to do something big. I want you to do something big for me. And I guess the question, are you his? Are you his? Or are you your resources money? Are you the money? Are you allowing the money to be your God? When God says dispense the sum of your dollars, he isn't talking about your money. That's just money. When he asks you to do something, just like this rich young ruler, he, he looks deeper than what you have in the bank and than where you live and what you do. He doesn't want your money. You know what he wants? He wants your life. He wants you to forsake it all. I'm not going to tell you to go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Because that's not what he's asking. He's asking us, what is your God? What is your God? Is your God pleasure? Is your God resources? Is your God your children? Is your God something? He wants to be Lord God. When God says dispense the sum of the dollars, it isn't about the money. God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. And he said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And I guarantee you that rich young ruler looked at this and he said, I have treasure now. I have what I want now. Why would I want to have treasures in heaven? Until you have the spiritual insight of what God can do within your life, you will never realize what spiritual treasures in heaven are. And it's not necessarily about money. You know what the spiritual treasure is that's so important? It's when you get to talk to somebody about Jesus. It's when you give your resources and, you, and they take them over to Africa and people give their life to Christ. It's when you help somebody at a, at a feeding center. It's when you support a church in the, in the soccer ministry and somebody gives their life to Christ. The spiritual rewards and the treasures that you have in heaven are so much more important than the junk that we can buy down here. This, you know, you buy a car, what happens? Five, seven years later, I want a new car. They, 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 nothing lasts. Everything is temporary. Eternal rewards is what we can give to God. And he wants to press us. He wants us to say, it's not about the money. It's about the willing heart to do something great for God. Whatever you give, wherever you give, it is about giving our life, our heart to God. When we give our heart, God will take it. 
He will change it. And he will move us. This rich young ruler that we have no idea who his name is. Jesus loved him. He didn't love Jesus. Jesus was offering him grace. He didn't accept it. Jesus looked at him with compassion in his eyes and said, there's one thing that you lack, and that's love for me. And there's many times in our church, in our life, Jesus is shining the light right into your heart, and he said, listen, guys, get your eyes off of your stuff. Get your eyes off of your job. Get your eyes off of your past. There's one thing that you lack, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And once you give your heart and your life to Jesus, you will abide in me. My words will be alive. You will desire the things of God. But until we abide in him, until we have that relationship with him, all we are is we're walking around wondering what's taking place, wondering why I'm not happy, wondering why I'm sad, wondering why my life is falling apart. Why? It's because you're not abiding in Christ. You're not having a relationship with him. You're walking away from Jesus with your head held low, saddened, because you just said no to God. Imagine what that guy would have been if he said, Lord, I don't know. I, yeah, this one's going to hurt. It's tough. I, I, dude, man, I have had money since I was, bo I was born with money. I've had more money to know. I don't know what I could do without money. I have had it. I like it. I kind of enjoy it, but if that's what you want me to do, <laughs> that means I'm going to have to make some changes. That means my life will never be the same. Parallel in our life, that means I may have to give up some stuff. That means I may have to quit doing some stuff. That means if I give you my life, I sell or I give away the junk in my life, I have to turn around and I have to embrace you and follow you? I have to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Imagine the change of that young man's life if he had said no to the junk and said yes to the Lord. We would not be talking to him in this way because when Jesus loved him, I believe that meant the power of God was upon him. He loved him in a way that it never said Jesus loved anybody before. He went face to face with an individual and he said, dude, I know all that stuff about you. And I know that you're not self-aware, that you know everything. You're not, you're not spiritual and you're, you're blinded in what you're going through. But I love you. And dude, there's one thing, just one thing that you're lacking you're lacking a relationship with me. You're allowing your stuff to block me. I'm saying just get rid of your stuff. And if you get rid of your junk, your gods, whatever that God is, if you get rid of that stuff and embrace me, I'm going to love you. I want you to follow me. I want to give you a place at my table. I want you to give a place where wherever I am, there you will be also. I want to give you a place for eternity. I want to store up all your treasures in heaven. And the treasures you're going to get in heaven, oh, they're going to be multiplied. They're going to be blessed. It's going to be the things of God within your life. We, the spiritual we say, yeah, I want to lay up my treasures in heaven. I want to do those things for God. But there's not, nah, I, I don't want to give all that up. And every day, in every one of our lives, I know I'm a follower of Christ, but God puts a searchlight into your heart, and he wants to radically change you. He wants to radically say, okay, I know you love me last week. I know that you gave last week. I know that you did this last month, but I want you to stay focused because resources are the biggest block to your pursuit to God. He wants to take care of you. He wants to love you, 
But he wants, most importantly, for us to follow him and to lay up our treasures in heaven. That's what he wants us to do. And that's what the church is all about. That's what we are here to do. The church is here to when God opens up the spotlight and puts it into your heart, puts it flat into your eyes, and you have to look at that spotlight and you have to either say, okay, I'm gonna stay in the middle of that spotlight. I'm gonna look deep to where God is talking to me about or we can walk away and say, yeah, not for me. Not for me. We are at a pivotal time. In our culture, we're at a pivotal time. In our culture, we believe God is there for us. We are thinking that God is there to bless us. We think that God is there to be our sugar daddy, to be our Christmas present. We think he's our Christmas, our Santa Claus. Give, 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 give. You know what God wants? He wants our heart. He wants everything about us. Whether it's $15, $100, $1,000, or $10,000. The money makes no difference. Remember the widow that had a little mite? And Jesus looked at her giving. And the disciples were saying, this is only a dollar. And Jesus looked and he said, she gave more than everyone else. And disciples, how could this little old woman that gave this little mite be more than anyone else? And Jesus said something that was so profound. He said, she gave out of her whole. They gave out of their abundance. Jesus sees what's in here. He already knows what's in your bank account. He doesn't care. What he wants to see, does he have this? So, Whose are you? Are you his? Do you love God? Will you walk away saying, Lord, I want to follow you? Or will you walk away with your head held low, saddened? So my question is twofold. Number one, if you walk to Christ today, he wants to receive you and he wants to love you. If you've never given your life to Christ, you're coming running to Jesus on the road and Jesus wants to lift you up and he wants to love you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to take you and change your life. The bad thing about this, you will never be able to be the same again. You can't come to Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive you and say, okay, I am forgiven. Now I'm gonna go do my own thing. He says, I'm going to forgive you and then I'm gonna put a spotlight right into your eyes and I'm going to ask you to make some radical changes. I'm going to ask you, you know what? I'm going to give you my salvation. Salvation is by grace. But after you receive me, I want you to abide in me. I want my words to abide in you. And then whenever you desire something, you can ask. And I'm going to take care of your life. But you can't come to me for fire insurance. I want to come to radically change your life. And I believe if we would do that, there's many people here that have never given their life to Christ that desperately need a relationship with Jesus. But yet they're afraid of what Jesus is going to ask them to do. So what they do, they turn around, they walk out of here saddened, and maybe they'll try it another day. Maybe Jesus will give them a better deal tomorrow. Maybe he won't make me think this much next month. But Jesus says, I love you. I love you. I want to give to you something that you cannot buy. You don't have enough money to buy. And that's God's love. God loved him no matter what. God loved him even though he knew that he wouldn't follow him. He loved him. And Jesus loves you and he wants you to follow him. That's the most important thing. But then for the Christians, here's what God wants you to do. He wants to stretch you. He wants to take you to a whole nother level where you are spiritually. He wants to take you where you've never gone before. He wants to take your heart and he wants to twist your heart. He wants to massage your heart. He wants to give you so, so much spirit of, of love and grace and empathy for people that when somebody is hurting, we shall know we're disciples when we have love one for another. The best attribute of a follower of Christ is the same attribute that God showed this rich young ruler. That's love. 
That's love. And he, 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 he wasn't very loving. He said, dude, you lack something. If you do this, this, and this, but you know what true love is? Hard love is, is when we see the truth, even if we don't like the truth, we're standing in that light. We're allowing that light to penetrate us. Oh, we can run into the darkness. We can hide from the light. But you know what? Jesus loves us enough. That light is going to shine right back into our face. He is going to give us that light, that penetrating heart, until it's our time to see what Christ wants, until we surrender him, until he moves us, until he changes us. You know what? It may not be money for you. It may be another issue for you. It may be athletics. Maybe addictions. But there's something there's something that's keeping you from following after Christ. It's not keeping you from coming to church. Ha, oh, we'll come to church. Christ doesn't just want us to come to church. He wants to own you. He wants to love you. He wants to be your Lord. Not just somebody you come to church and sing about. Not somebody you learn about. He wants to change your life. So if you've never given your life to Christ... I want to invite you to do that today. Some of you need a relationship with Jesus more than anything in the world. Sometimes we're struggling, we're hurting, and we know that we're destitute. We know that we're away from God and that God seems so distant and our sin is so great and we wake up every morning with no hope and Jesus says, I want to give you hope. And then some of you that are Christians, he is prodding at your heart there's things within your life that become idols and gods that God is saying, I want you to give it up. I want you to move past that. And every day you wake up and you say, not today. Not today, not today, not today. And every time we say no to God, it becomes easier to say no to God. And every time we say no to God, we walk away with our head held low and are saddened because we know what God can do and what God wants to do. But what we have to do is we have to embrace what he asks. And he asked us to love him, to follow him. He asked us to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us stand to our feet. Let us have a word of prayer. and We're going to sing a song of invitation. I plead to you, don't walk away. Don't walk away as this rich young, this rich young ruler did, saddened and hurt because he did not want to do what Jesus asked him to do. Come to him. Allow him to change your life. Allow the penetration of the Spirit's light within your life to say, yes, I will do what you've asked me to do, and I will follow you to wherever you want me to go. Dear Father, Lord, bless this invitation. Bless our hearts. Change our lives. Let us see what you want us to see. Let us do what you want us to do. We thank you for an illustration of somebody that came to you, but yet walked away from you. Lord, let us never be that man that says no to you. Let us say yes to what you want within our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Justin, if you would, please.